So I'm in uh, Malaysia, in Malacca, and I've been traveling for almost, let's say, four years. I've gone back to do my taxes, but uh, for the most part, I've been continuously traveling uh, for the last four years. And I'm sort of dreading going back simply because I'm sure people will ask me, you know, what have I learned? You know, what, 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 what suggestions do you have? And the problem is that none of my suggestions will be valid because all advice is local. And so let me give you an example. So the way I got here was on a bus. Well, the Malaysians, um, if you book on a Malaysian bus, you want to sit in the back. The back of the bus is the nicest place to be in, if you're in Malaysia. Uh, and it's only about one euro or two dollars uh, for the bus ticket. And, you know, I, I ended up buying the insurance because it was like 50 cents. So I thought, why not? Let's go ahead and throw in an insurance policy. So ultimately, you sort of start thinking about these things and you start think, thinking about history. But, you know, you don't want to sort of apply things across time, across different time periods and across different geographies. So you don't want to be saying, well, the back of the bus in Malaysia was amazing and that's where you want to sit. You don't want to be saying to somebody in the southern United States, you know, Rosa Parks had it good. You know, she had to sit in the back of the bus. Maybe they were doing her a favor. You don't want to do that. And one of the issues, of course, is that things change. But let's say you go to London. You go down to London and they have a very good system called the underground. That's where you have all these t-shirts to say, mind the gap. But, you know, you've got a very complex system as well to the point where you have to have employees stationed next to kiosks, next to, you know, just inside offices on the top level to tell you where to go. Because there, because there are so many tourists in London and the system is so complex, nobody outside of London uh, can really understand it. <clears throat> and, you know, you ask yourself, why, why is that? Why is that the case? Well, because physical infrastructure, and this is something you learn, physical infrastructure can't, you know, it's not like you get rid of it. You build a building, you're not going to dump that building when it gets old. You might paint it, um, you know, you, you, in, in very, very unusual scenarios, like in Las Vegas, you might actually blow down the building and build it up again just to build a new one. But that's, that only typically happens in places like Las Vegas that have, you know, a, a totally different set of rules. In most places, if you build a building, it's still there. Uh, and it's the same thing when 100 years ago, it's still there. It's falling apart. The real estate developer, whoever owns it, doesn't want to put, you know, do any kind of an upgrade. So it's still there. Same thing with, you know, when you go to a foreign country and you say, why doesn't this make any sense? What kind of idiot designed all these things? Well, you have to understand that when the first section of that, whatever it is you're looking at was built, it was probably genius. It was probably revolutionary. But 50 years later, it looks like an idiot built it. Because now you've got new technology. And so you've built something on top of that or next to it that, e that either makes the old look, look poor in comparison or it just doesn't quite add up in, in a seamless way. So you go to the underground and it looks like a maze. It looks like something that, you know, you know something out of the movie Saw that you have to solve, uh, you know, in, in order not to die. And of course, it's not, it wasn't intended to be that way. Same thing with South Korea. And these are, and let me remind you, these are advanced countries. These are developed countries. And so you start to realize, you know, you've got a system where, you know, you're really dealing with physical infrastructure. And that's why people are so excited about digital infrastructure, because you can get dumped the old one uh, or just copy it like Facebook does with Snap. And therefore, you know, have a really an easier time, an easier time you know, sort of shifting into a new millennium. That's what it's supposed to be like. So you go to London and you, and you also start to realize things like this debate between you know, socialism and capitalism, political, why politics are so different all over the world. If, and if you're in London and you realize that, you know, this is a pretty good deal here, you know, I get to go all, all, all over the city, uh, fairly cheap, uh, depending on whether I get a week pass, a month pass, and so on. And that's when you sort of start to realize that, you know, why is it that people in the UK who also have, who, have, who also have access to something to subsidized healthcare, why do they sort of support more liberal politicians up to a point? That hasn't been the case in the recent elections, but for the most part, when you talk about UK politics, you're talking about sort of labor versus the conservatives, and they go back and forth. Labor, you know, builds something, they get credit for it, 
they win a lot of votes because they also have a lot of jobs that come along with it, which includes the guy helping you at the train station, at the ticket office, and they win. Over time, right, new technology comes in, the old system doesn't get an upgrade, and ultimately people get, people get frustrated and they vote whoever built that first building or that first station, they vote that person out, and that's when the conservatives come to power, when the liberals fail. They, they, they have the ideas, they fail, somebody else comes in promising to fix it, oftentimes promising to tear the building down. It's promises to tear the building down under the assumption that you will create a position, situation where something new and better will take its place. But of course, whoever promises to tear that building down doesn't always know whether or not the next the replacement will be better. So it's all a chance, and sometimes the chances work out. Sometimes they don't. So that's what happens when you travel. You start to think about things in context. So with this sort, sort of perennial debate between socialism or liberalism and conservative, you know, being conservative, you start to realize a lot of it is location-based. But you also start to realize that there are fundamental differences that probably need to be respected. And so, for example, with that political debate, you know, if, if in fact you are in the UK, you start to realize that you know, people like big government, but only when it's giving them something. So if you want a centralized government, it has to give you something. Otherwise, you end up with multiple standards. And this is why people like centralized governments, because if you have this, this you know, maze of a transportation map, you start to realize maybe it's not a bad idea to have a single party system. And then you realize why China, right, is number one when it comes, and Japan, when they're, when they're both number one when it comes to building trains, when it comes to doing things like renewable energy, because you don't have multiple standards. You don't have a situation where the construction companies that are associated with the liberals come into power, they build for four years, and then the conservatives come into power, they build for four years, sometimes eight. Suddenly you have this sort of, you know, suddenly you have a maze that needs employees in order to function in order to help. So you can see right off the bat, you've got, this, you've got this debate between a single standard and multiple standards. And you see that even when you're going into a hotel room like this one, you see it immediately. In fact, the first thing you see when you travel is in fact, the fact that you need multiple adapters, just like this one. And this one over here, I've got, just, just me, I've got about four different adapters and sometimes they work, sometimes they don't. Um, and that's, that right off the bat is the first thing you notice. Again, this, this debate between a single standard and a different, uh, uh, multiple standards. And in this case, it's not, it's easy to fix, right? A hotel was built by somebody that, is, uh, that was associated with somebody else in power that favored this standard. Having that standard makes it difficult for someone else to come in and rewire everything in the hotel to fit their map, to fit whatever plans whatever architectural designs that they already have that they built in some other country, you can't just, you know, sort of take those plans, come into this country, apply it, and basically, you know, make money because you, you have a higher margin, right? You, you go into one country, it costs a lot of money and a lot of debt. This is where you understand how banks and capitalism go in together. You have a lot of money, you have, you have a great design, but you need money. So you go in debt, you go to the bank, you build this, you build this uh, new design, this new standard, and then over time, it works. And so you have a reputation. That reputation hopefully precedes you when you go and apply for an RFP or some other, you know, bid. And you make a bid, you win. But you can't, if there's different standards, you can't sort of lower costs, right? You have to actually create new, another new plan instead of being able to copy and paste. And what businesses like to do, they like to copy and paste. And the justification for that is that whatever is being built, whatever bank loaned them the money to build those new designs, that was a better, that was, whatever it was, it was better than it was before. It was better than it was before. So you can see right off the bat, you travel, you have different standards. You can see that over time, which sometimes, you know, you know, political parties and the corporations that support them and the banks that support them are not always on the same page. And they're not always on the same page. And when that happens, the opposition tends to win. Over time, things become too complex when you have competition. And capitalism is all about competition. It's all about choices. But you can also see that life would be much more simple if you simply had one, just one plug, just one standard, and you kept building on top of that standard. But 
if you do that, what happens? You don't necessarily get the benefit of an upgrade. And then you also have the fact that whoever is on the old standard gets to have more and more political power because they, they, they were the ones that came first. And because they were the ones that came first, they have the source code. They have the original plans. They can build on that. They can unionize. They, can, they, don't, they don't even have to do that in some countries. They can simply immediately get access to the governor's ear because they have sort of the Bible or the Quran or the Talmud of whatever structure is in place. So you can see p p politics. It's all about multiple standards. It's all about the upgrade. And when you don't have this competition, you go to some place like Egypt, you go to Alexandria, and all of us are used to seeing pictures of the pyramids. But if you don't go to, to these touristy places, you just go to, to a normal city. You sh this all makes sense. You see construction that was built by the French in, a, in an obviously Baroque style, a Baroque, just really out there. Lots of colors, really, you know, sort of fluffy and, you know, big, in your face. That's Baroque. It's French. You start to see that, wait a second, whoever built this, whoever, whatever standard they used, they're not, they haven't come back in about, in about 50 years. These buildings look like they're about to fall down. So, let's go back. Let's go backwards. Let's sort of go back a little bit. You've got standards. You've got foreign investment, sometimes by choice. Sometimes not by choice. And that's what war is. You take over a country, you prop up the governor or the president or the prime minister. You take a photo op with the guy in front of you, typically not smiling. The reason the guy's not smiling is because he's just signed a piece of paper, a contract that puts his country, almost always a his, his country in debt for the next 100 years. Not only in debt, but in debt and whatever in the other guy's currency. So you're in Egypt. Egypt and Lebanon still use the British pound. They don't even have their own currency. So, you go back, you travel, you see these things happening, you ask yourself, what's going on? You go back to the United States, you see this battle between socialism, libertarianism, all these things, right? And you start to realize that it's not only the single standard, but you also start to realize that fundamentally, Socialism works if someone is giving you something, because once you give somebody something, whether it's healthcare um, at a lower cost than the private market, uh, whether it's public transportation at a lower cost than an Uber, hopefully more convenient, you start to realize that it works in, in the same way that parents and children work. So you have a central authority that manages the standards, makes sure, makes sh certain that the standards do not multiply out of control. If the standards multiply out of control, if you have unauthorized, unauthorized builders on a different standard on the outskirts of town, we call that a black market. But in reality, it's just a place where the central government hasn't had a chance to enter with its corporations, with its businesses, with its construction firms, with, with whatever it is that, that it's familiar with. So when that happens, the black market goes in, we call that the mafia, or we call that foreign direct investment. Uh, we're always cautious about that because foreign direct investment brings in possibly a different set of standards that have to be worked around if it's a physical infrastructure. So we think about these things, we think about these things, and we say digital infrastructure. What happens with digital infrastructure? It's a winner-take-all game. We don't have to destroy the old building can copy whoever, whatever, whoever comes in, like Facebook and Snap, or you just end up with a monopoly that's based on merit, like Google. Anybody use Bing? Anybody even remember, unless you've seen the Steven Spielberg movie, uh, Ready Player One, you've got Ask Jeeves, none of those exist, or they actually do exist, just nobody uses them. So you've got this digital infrastructure that is that almost sort of in an age of technology, means that you focus on a single party system because in many cases, unless the government breaks it up, you're, you, you basically have a single standard which then helps you move towards a more centralized government, a more centralized government. So that hasn't happened in the, in the US yet. That has not happened in the US yet. But it has happened in China. It's happened in Singapore happened in actually a lot of countries because technology makes it easier to have more information 
and to move closer to a single standard, which ultimately gives you less choice. You go out and you go to a Starbucks, and this isn't unique to single party systems. What I'm trying to say is that it's almost always the same because the politics follows technology, it follows businesses, and war is basically technology battling the other guy's technology. And that's why countries that have succeeded in technology, whether it's a nuclear bomb, whether it's nuclear fusion, uh, whether it's AI, that's why all these things are being pushed upon us. Because whoever masters the best technology can then essentially set the standard. So let's go back. Let's go backwards. Walk, walk back a little bit. So you've got this battle between different standards. And you've got a situation where socialism works as long as you're giving somebody something at a lower cost than the private market. When that happens, you can simply say, listen, these guys over here, they're just trying to you know, overcharge you. They're trying to exploit you. We need us to protect you. You can see very quickly, it's very much like a parent and a child, very much like a parent and a daughter or a parent and a son. And, you, and kids, we expect them to listen to their parents. We expect them to have rules. Why? Because they set the standard. Even the relationship is kind of interesting, right? And the way that it mimics the political structure. You know, you've got a president and a vice president. So you've got a sort of, if you can think about it, you've got a mother and a father. You've even got one leader that starts with a P and the other one that starts with a V. You can make your own judgments on, on that. Uh, I won't make that for you. But you can see very quickly that the standard in the West mimics the standard in the home when it comes to socialism. But we get older, and then we also realize why capitalism and, and people who are against socialism rise up. Why? Let's say you have a good set of parents. No one's going to complain if you have to follow the rules. Mom and dad stay together, take care of their kids, go to work, do a good job, have integrity. People will, the kids are expected to fall in line. What if you have a bad set of parents? What if you have a bad P and a bad VP? Then you can see that things you don't, you're not gonna listen to your parents unless they give you something. So the mom and dad said, we're not gonna give you anything. Follow the rules, it's not gonna work. At the very minimum, you have to have a bed, you have to have a room. All these things amount to bribes. And you have a lot of people that, that accept that paradigm when it comes to the home, but not when it comes to the political system. You can point that out, but then you also have to point out the fact that what if you have, after four years, a bad set of parents? Or that they don't even have to be bad, they can just be misguided. You don't have to, just, you don't have to be evil to destroy something. And that's when you say, wait a second, so if that happens, I've got to run away. I become a runaway if I'm a kid. You can see how all these things happen. I go to the outskirts. I try to go away. I try to go to places where the centralized system does not have its hands it does not have, where it doesn't have its hands in the bucket, where it doesn't have control. And that's where you have the rebels. That's where you have people who are different. And that's what you see in the US, where the rebels are more respected than the police. And that's why you know that things are not working out, is when that happens. When the rebels are more respected than the establishment. When the rappers are more respected than the politicians. When the writers, online or more have better things to stay and more interesting things to stay than the politicians. You can see how, once again, the centralized structure falls apart. It's harder, it's easier, obviously, to fall apart in a bigger country because of this, what we talked about before. Harder to do in Singapore because it's smaller. It's easier for the central government to establish a standard and stick to it and improve that standard. So Singapore, let's get back to travel. Uh, all the cars have to be at least... Uh, can, cannot be older than 10 years. So you think technology, Singapore is gonna be number one in the whole world in car technology because none of the cars are allowed to get old. Self-driving, who do you think is gonna take over that? Which country do you think will be number one when it comes to self-driving cars when the technology um, is released? It's gotta be Singapore. It's not gonna be some Google city in Canada. It's gotta be Singapore because they already have a system where everything is going to be new. And because it's gonna be new, and they have a license and they have a strict standard for taxi drivers, you can see very quickly how that single standard helps Singapore stay number one in Southeast Asia. But you can also see how things are expensive and how you can still have a rubble movement because prices go up too high and that 
that is where inflation comes in. So even if governments do well, even if, even if your mom and dad give you a nice house, uh, or sorry, a nice room and a house, if they make you do too many chores, you're still gonna rebel. You're still gonna rebel. And you might even run away. So you can see why inflation is such a big problem. It's always on the minds of any politician in government, even if they do a good job. And in fact, the system is almost designed to the point where if they do a good job, prices go up. And that's what doesn't make any sense. And when you're a socialist, you look around, all you see, you don't have to be a socialist, you can just be a regular, a regular working stiff. You see, hey, wait a second, why are my bills going up every year? You don't see it in the context of, well, we want prices to go up because we took out debt. Somebody took out debt a long time ago to build this you know, first building that we're now improving upon. So we, now we've got to pay off that debt, come on, you know, sort of build a new standard and keep going. We've got to keep going. And it all begins to feel like you're on a hamster wheel. It's not an accident. It's built into the system. It's a feature, not a bug. Because remember, governments care about inflation and they care about war. And whoever has the best technology wins the war. All these things go together. Go to Vietnam. Hanoi, the North. The North won the war. The South lost the war. Who do you think is more developed? Hanoi has a French Quarter. It looks like uh, uh, any other European city, for the most part, the North. The South is disorganized. It, and that's not something that's an accident, right? Who do you think got more investment? Well, you, and what do you think is going on even today with the power of the centralized government to be able to reach all the way down into the South. Again, each scenario is local because if you go to a, another place like Dresden that was completely bombed out after the war as Kurt Vonnegut taught us, uh, Dresden is now probably the nicest city to live in. Not necessarily, you know, Berlin is always the best place to visit in Germany, but if you wanna live in Germany, it's a place that was bombed out horrifically, that was targeted by the British specifically to terrorize the Germans, specifically to target German civilians in order to force the Germans to back off or give up. And today, that same city that was firebombed uh, is now the best place to live because it has had a central government that was able to go in, able to go in and fix it and come up to a standard that makes sense. All these things make sense. You can't stop thinking about these things when you travel. So, capitalism and socialism. So, capitalism is basically this idea that we're afraid that the parents you have today might die, God forbid, and the guy who comes in in the next four years, the guy who comes in in the next four years, right, won't be so um, benign or just might not be as smart. So, we want capitalism because we want more choices. We understand there's more complexity. If the complexity gets to be too much, then you have a revolution or you have a change in government when the complexity gets to be too much. Because in order to have a private market, uh, in order to have improvements, you have to have choices. But what, we, what we're seeing now all over the world is the choices are fictional. It's like going to a Starbucks, saying this is fantastic, and then going over to Seattle's best coffee and not realizing it's all the same company. It's like, going, I mean, you look all over the world, you have these sorts, sorts of slates of hand where you think you're getting something different. And human beings want something different. That's when you travel. That's why when you travel, you feel so good. You're seeing something different all the time. So people seem to want something different. So people ask me, what have you learned when you travel? Well, another thing I've learned um, is why products are so different all over the world. Like why don't I have access to more choices if I live in a free market? I should have access to anything I want. Now with Amazon, nope. You ever see this drink? Well, here, this is actually the best ginger ale. It's fantastic. It's, um, it used to be British, now it's owned by a Thai company. The whole structure doesn't make any sense to me. Uh, check this out. Can you get this? Sparkling date. Sparkling date beverage. Never seen it before. So right off the bat, it's Thai. Interesting, right? You become number one, you have that one product, the ginger, that is just better than everybody else. And the next thing you know, uh, you've got that supply chain, you perfect that supply chain, you go back and suddenly, hey, you share that information, and now you've got another drink. I haven't tried this one before. But it's not just this one, it's almost everything. You go to Georgia. Georgia has a drink with, uh, called Borjomi. Haven't seen it in the US. It's fantastic. If you like sparkling water, that's the best one. It's not in the US. And Georgia, along with Ukraine, is a major ally of the United States. It's supposed to be a major ally of the United States and you still can't get 
one of their best products in the United States. What's going on if capitalism exists, if we have free markets? What's going on when these choices don't trickle down in a way that makes sense? That's pretty good. Sweet. It's really sweet. The Arabs, who are, of course, trying to export... Um, the Arabs are now trying to... Uh, they own a lot of land overseas. Um, and because they can't you know, grow food efficiently uh, within their territories, and so they bought land all, all, all over the world, and they're trying to perfect honey and dates. And so, not bad. Uh, not, not sure if I'd buy it again, but not bad. But... And go back and forth. The other thing you see, we talked about inflation, we talked about war, we talked about technology. When you travel, things all make sense. Things make sense. And it's harder for people to lie to you, but it doesn't matter because you also start to see that the choices that you see are not necessarily true choices. So what do you do? It's very easy to become cynical um, over time because you do start to see the whole world as a distraction movement. And that's when you become pessimistic. What I'm telling you is that it's not necessarily the end goal to make you pessimistic when you travel. It should be the other way around. And the question is, how do we make sure we, we become optimistic? The way we do that is we understand history. If we understand history, the next time we see some fake news, it's harder for that fake news to convince you because you've either seen it before in terms of the demagoguery of immigrants, in terms of the demagoguery of whatever minority happens to be in your country. And you've seen it before. You've seen it, you know, and it's, it's everything. The whole United States, the people in the United States, in fact, uh, which is why I'm so disappointed in the country today, in 2020, is that the entire country, are the basically Protestant refugees uh, post French Revolution. The French Revolution was against, was basically an anti-Catholic revolution. You wanna talk about a centralized structure? Look at the Catholic Church. That's a centralized structure. So you, within Europe, the wars typically happened uh, when you had the centralized structure coming into power, kicking everyone out, whether it was Protestant, Jew, uh, it's just kicking everyone out. This goes back all the way back to the Crusades when one of the popes, I think it was Pope Urban, ordered the Crusades uh, to take back Jerusalem. That was what the Crusades were all about. You have a centralized structure, then you have war, then you have technology, whoever has all of that together advances. Doesn't mean that they're the best ideas. They just happen to be, in many cases, lucky, or they happen to be in the right place at the right time, and so on. Um, so you keep going, you look, at all, you look at all these things. America, Catholic Church comes into power, a lot of Protestants flee, um, and the Catholic Church in England becomes the Anglican Church, same structure, but different name in order to appease the king, go back and forth. Then you've got, you know, then you've got the Catholics coming back into power. They sort of go into Germany um, in the Saxony area. The Saxony area is now the most conservative area within Germany. And that is, again, a centralized structure. Uh, so central, centralization doesn't always mean liberalism. It doesn't always mean, it could also mean the Catholic Church. It could also go the other way. So think about that when you think about socialism. You think, when you think about a centralized system, when you think about a single standard, when you think about the idea of being able to replicate things like healthcare and education in the private market more efficiently over time, because you have that institutional knowledge and you've done it before and you do a copy and a paste. Socialism doesn't always have to be liberal. United States, Catholic Church then becomes corrupt, starts killing all the scientists, Spanish Inquisition. Where do you think those people went? They went at great risk at great cost to themselves, with great uncertainty to the United States, to Canada, for a better life. Over time, right, that's the French Revolution, more, you know, essentially, at that point, you had the Catholics going to America. And when the Catholics went to America, a lot of them were Irish and Italian. That's where you had that anti-immigrant sentiment, because it was the Protestants against the Catholics within the United States. Then you had the war in Germany. You had two wars. That's where... What's the most, what's, what's the biggest ethnic group in the U.S. right now? Germans, right? Why? You had two wars. Where did they all go? They went to the United States. That land that the, with the French, with the French Revolution, that land where the French gave the United States the Statue of Liberty, that's where they went. Today, 
Catholics, a majority Catholic Supreme Court, which has been majority Catholic for quite some time, ruled against, or actually didn't rule against, you have to be careful here because it's law, and, and, and law is very, 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 very specific, allowed a presidential executive order to go forward on national security grounds, it's national security grounds that allow the uh, targeting or, the, or a more severe restriction to be placed on immigrants coming from primarily Muslim countries. That happened a couple of years ago. I resigned, by the way, from the Washington DC bar. I sent it in my resignation um, and resigning because of that decision. I still have a California bar license. I might get rid of that too. So you see all these things coming full circle, but you can also see why it's not a good time to be proud to be American because for the most part, Americans don't understand their own history. And the reason they don't understand their own history because they, they don't travel and when they do travel, they go down and they go to a bar and they don't really look around them uh, in ways that make, that allow them to make sense of their own history. Because what America has been, has been a repository of European immigrants and war refugees. At the same time in the 1960s, when all this came to a head, and the Catholic Church, just like they did with the Crusades, went down to the government and said, let's go ahead and invade Vietnam. We're gonna, we're gonna go ahead and get a Catholic guy who we like called Diem. We're gonna install him in South Vietnam, tell all the Catholics in the North to go down, and we're gonna split the country. We're gonna tear the country apart in order to expand our influence. And this will be good for American corporations. It will be good for us. It will be good for everybody. And right now we were justified in doing this because we think that the Catholics in Vietnam are, uh, are being exploited or are not being treated fairly, just like the Russians. The same thing the Russians said when they went into Crimea, that we have Russian speakers in this area. Uh, we need to go in, uh, we need to go in and save them. This, this sort of thing happens all the time. It's all linked together over and over and over again. So Vietnam, Diem gets installed. <laughs> There's a split. Catholic Church then allows itself to be, uh, allows the United States to go so far as to have a draft to go into Vietnam to split the country apart. Uh, Catholic Church basically gives it, gives the war its own, its blessing because it stands to benefit. These poor guys going into Vietnam don't realize they've been drafted in order to expand the power of a centralized government that is in the United States, that is, that is building power in the United States to the point where the front runners, the front runner now for the United States in 2020, we go all the way back until you can see how power consolidates. You build that building, you get that vote because that building or the transportation system that you've built, you control the standard. You control the standard, you keep the power, you build the political structure around that physical infrastructure. So in 1960, you get to tell the government to go to war, you expand your influence. Even, even when you lose the war, uh, you can always go back, you know, um, just, like the, just, just like the Catholic Church did in Germany, in Saxony. They went back and they had the new Holy See. The new Holy See. So, you lose Vietnam. Fast forward today, Catholic Church, majority Catholic, President Biden, Catholic. All of that, you can see in my hometown of San Jose, police chief, and that last name, Garcia, looks white, just like all the popes, right? Just like all the popes, looks white. Uh, last name Garcia, go to Mexico. Hey, the Zocalo, the Zocalo, that central structure everywhere you go is the Catholic Church. That kind of makes sense. You build the building, fix the standard, get the votes, funnel money through foreign investment, get more voters and establish power. My city, both of the mayors in the last, in, I think two, two elections ago, both of them went to private the same Catholic high school. Same Catholic high school. Go to Singapore. Prime Minister, great guy. Also went to a Catholic private school. Uh, Lee. Not, uh, sorry. Well, the son of Prime Minister LKY. Singapore. Amazing country. The founder of Singapore. I'm, I'm in Malaysia. They used to be one country. Uh, talk about a single standard. A uh, double standard happening. Uh, great history. I'm not going to go into it now. Too complicated to talk about in this same, in this same little spiel. Get the standard, establish power, build the building, and then you can consolidate power around a political structure as long as you give people something. And if you're in the private, if you're in the business, in the private sector, you've got to do a better job giving people something uh, that's better than whatever it is the government 
is giving. Otherwise, you lose credibility. You can also see why you have the most liberal, Obama, being replaced by the most conservative, Trump. Although they're not really, I mean, they're not really conservative and they're not really liberal. Those, those labels don't make any, don't really mean anything. Once we understand history, they don't mean anything. It's just a standard. You want that standard or you want another standard. The bigger the country, the easier it is to have multiple standards that then result in frayed social cohesion because you've got people not only on a different standard, they're, they're getting different information. You know, in the old days, it was a little easier, right? You build a building, everyone walks into the same front door. Not anymore. The digital infrastructure, you've got maybe one sort of source code at the very bottom, but different doors based on the algorithm. And, and, and because you've got a single standard, whether it's a Facebook or a Google, Google or an Apple, a trillion dollar companies, by the way, <sighs> talk about power. You know, it's, it's not as if you've got a government that's able to regulate them properly or even to break them up. It's not, it's, it's not, and it's also not at all obvious that breaking these companies up will result in a better quality of life. Uh, because again, technology, technology, war, you have all these things tied together, uh, access, satellites, all these things go together, you know. So that's what happens when you travel. That's what I want to tell people when I travel. Um, these are the things I pick up. And I've got a whole other, a lot of other ideas on religion. Um, you know, if you go to Northern Africa, everyone's sort of mixed. Anywhere the Muslims have gone, uh, they don't appear to have a centralized structure. And when you don't have a centralized structure, it's, it's harder to have segregation. In almost every country that has a, I mean, that, that I've, in the, in the West, segregation seems to be a way of life. And so being in Asia, you see all kinds of colors. You go to Indonesia, everyone's a different color. And that's a country that's had the Portuguese, the Dutch, the Dutch were there for 400 years. Um, you go down there and, and you just, you get kind of, it becomes weird to only see white and black and some brown being, you know, Hindu. Over here, even the Indians, right? You have the Tamils from Sri Lanka, which used to be called Ceylon. They're really, they're really dark, and they're almost black. Uh, I mean, this is just, this is just Malaysia. You've got the Malays who are all kinds of different colors, some, some shade of brown, but they're sometimes mixed in with the Chinese. Um, and then you've got, you know, the, even in Singapore, the guy is, you know, Puranakan, Puranakan, which means Chinese immigrants who came into Malacca, which is where I am right now, mixed in with the locals. Sometimes they were Muslim, sometimes, sometimes they were not, adopted their culture, um, and created this sort of unique sort of hybrid of Portuguese, Chinese, Muslim, Malay, not always, not always Muslim, but Malay for sure. And that's where you have all these things coming together in a melting pot, which is where a real melting pot, not a fake one that's, you know, you call it, call it a melting pot, but it's really segregation. It's really completely segregated to the point where you have just white, black, and then brown immigrants. You don't have that here. It's normal here in a Muslim country. You go to Northern Africa, people, all kinds of, you know, the British would call it swarthy. Swarthy, what does that mean? <laughs> you know, it, it's, it was a derogatory term because the British were so used to segregation as a way of life that when they would colonize another country, they would promote whoever had light skin. The Hindus, now in India, you're talking about them being nationalistic. They're just imitating what they had under the British colon no, colony because the British came in, right? They had a centralized government. They split it up. They had a whole divide and conquer strategy. But of course, it's, it's when people talk about divide and conquer, the British would respond to you and they would say, well, listen, we have to have a backup. I mean, if Hong Kong doesn't work out, then we need Singapore. So it's not really dividing and conquering. We have to have a backup to make sure that you get your, your drinks, uh, whatever you want, in a timely manner. That you get not just your drinks, but your cars, everything else, everything else that makes cooperation across borders worthwhile. But of course, it's just more than that. When you go to a Muslim country, lots of different colors, uh, and when you don't see colors, it's weird because you don't have that same attitude towards segregation, which then takes you back to Islam. When, when you suddenly realize that actually it was Muhammad not, uh, that basically spoke out against slavery um, far, you know, a thousand years or so before, you know, anyone in Europe, you know, sort of had decided to have, um, you know, decided to, to step up on a moral perch and say the same things. Um, more than a thousand years, actually. Uh, so then you realize why, you know, Muhammad Ali is called Muhammad Ali and not Cassius Clay. You realize why Kareem Abdul-Jabbar is called Kareem Abdul-Jabbar and not Lou Alcindor. By the way, Lou Alcindor went to a Catholic school. LeBron James went to a Catholic school. You start to see physical buildings. 
that then translate into abstract power structures like education and so on, which then goes all the way up, all the way up into the political power structure until you get a real education and you realize why things are the way they are. But it's a 40 minute speech so far and I've only begun to hit the tip of the iceberg. So I think I'll end there. Good luck.